Hello, everyone. This is Mark Holthy, Canadian immigration lawyer, ex-immigration officer, and former high school teacher coming to you live once again on our Express Entry Law private Facebook group. If you are not a member and you're watching this on the Canadian Immigration Institute, all you have to do is get yourself a Facebook um, page and then slide on over, do a quick search for Express Entry Law, and you will be able to find our group. It is the largest one out there. We're over 121,000 people in our group. And if you want to attend this session live and get your questions answered live by me, Mark Holthy, that's the best way to do it. For those of you who are tuning in also on the Canadian Immigration Institute YouTube channel and you want to send in a question in advance for me to consider, like these awesome people did right here, you can do so as well by sending an email right here to mholthy, and I'll pull the right one up here, mholthy at stringham.ca, and don't forget to put EE Live Q&A in the subject line. All right, let's slide these back where they belong down there out of the way so they're not interfering. Um, as always, I want to let everybody know that this, these episodes that I do on a weekly basis, and I want to apologize, last week I wasn't able to get one um, released, but all of these are actually sponsored by my Express Entry Complete Step-by-Step -step Guide to Doing It Yourself. And guys, I am going to offer another discount, a special Christmas bonus offer for all of you that is gonna be released here in just a few days. So stay tuned for that. But this complete step-by-step -step guide to doing it yourself is, is how I can do this. Many people say, well, Mark, how can you afford to take time out of your practice every week and do these videos, which takes so much time to queue up and to, you know, to answer people's questions and get everything all set up and spin it out to YouTube and the other uh, social media sites that you have. Because guys, I am a one hit wonder here. I don't employ anyone else other than me to do that. Well, this is how. It's this express entry complete step-by-step -step guide to doing it yourself. So thanks to the just, we're almost thousands of subscribers literally to this guide um, for your contributions, for using it, for benefiting from it. Because in reality, those who pay for it um, are benefiting everybody else that joins in and becomes a part of our Express Entry Law Facebook group um, and ultimately that attends and, and watches these live broadcasts. So I'll pull that one off out of the way. Just wanted to remind everyone about that. Those of you who are tuning in live, um, welcome. I actually was experimenting with a few things today to try to sort out uh, the best ways of getting this message out to the world and uh, and trying to notify people because as always when you get a group this big apparently Facebook doesn't think the people in my own Express Entry Law Facebook group actually want to watch <laughs> what I'm sharing and it's it's kind of comical a little bit it's quite a bit disheartening too because I know when I do these live videos I get so many people telling me Mark how do I find it how do I find it well I'm going to share my screen quickly with you all and I'm going to point out to something even though you're not able to attend maybe necessarily um, I'll just go to YouTube here maybe you're not able to attend live always always remember and uh, let's see oh I guess I got to log out of this one once again there's no prep for this guys this is this is me um, <laughs> just floundering along and now I've got to sign into the proper one here and then that will allow me to take you over to uh, this channel right here, which is the uh, Canadian Immigration Institute right here. And so every post that I do here, every live video that I do, I spin off and make sure that you guys have access to everything right here. And it's kind of cool because this group just keeps growing and growing. We're up to almost, well, 12,400 people right now. So if you miss this episode or you miss a past one, you can go back and see chronologically all the other uh, posts that I have made in the past. And so I just wanted to point that out to all of you awesome listeners who are, uh, who are um, maybe catching this as a recording or those of you who just happen to find it live today and are wondering how the heck do I find it? Now, with that being said, actually I'm going to shift back to my screen again. In our group, I've also tried to post in the announcement section um, that, that these videos are actually being done every, and actually it's event, sorry, the event section, that these, um, these live videos are recurring. And so this event is always going to be in here now. 
Um, it's going to be Tuesday at noon Mountain Standard Time. And the reason I do that is because it's my lunch break. And so I basically bring my, my, my lunch and um, I kind of eat it quick while I'm prepping for the video. And then I give up my lunch so that I can do this for all of you awesome viewers. Okay, as people start to pile in, um, as always, I love to hear where you guys are listening from. So please post in the comments below where you're listening. And uh, um, it's just, it, it blows my mind how broad this uh, is the reach of this video. I never would have dreamed that doing these live Facebook broadcasts would have reached so many people in such a diverse geographic region. So those of you awesome people who are tuning in live and are watching this live, let me know where you are watching from because I absolutely love to uh, to learn about um, all the different places that you are tuning in. And I also recognize that some of you guys are listening from a very, very long ways away and in many cases are listening at, well, midnight, 1, 2 a.m. So if you also want to throw in there where you're listening from, that would be totally cool as well. All right. So as I look at the comments here, we've got Imizi uh, who says, Hi, Mark. Hi, how are you? Uh, Maru says, uh, hi, love your live sessions. Very informative. You're very welcome, Maru. Um, let's see, who else do we have here? Nauman says, we should expect New Year discount. Yes, Nauman, you can expect the New Year's discount. It's going to happen before New Year's. All right. Um, Amir's from Egypt. Hi, Amir. Wakas says, hello. Hi, my friend. Uh, Umuna says, hi, I'm from Algeria. Very cool. Sanjeev is from India. Um, Sohan is tuning in from Sri Lanka. Uh, Maru is uh, high from Saudi Arabia. Great, Maru. That's awesome. And Faraj is from Libya. So we've got people, like I said, all over the world. Xavier is tuning in from Pakistan. Uh, he says, very informative. Thanks for making this group. You know what, guys? The whole Express Entry Law um, private Facebook group, and for those of you tuning in on the Institute, Canadian Immigration Institute YouTube channel, as I share my screen again here and I flip over to the actual page, um, one thing I want to point out for those who are choo choosing to join, and um, here's an example of some member requests. I have three specific questions that I ask, and it's really important that you actually answer them because if you don't, your request to join the group will be declined. Why do I do that? It's because I don't want any spammers in there. And some people will look at the questions and, um, and some won't answer. And when I look and I see that someone is being invited by someone that's a current member, I do cut them some slack because they may not know um, about the questions. And so I do have a tendency to approve them. Um, so if they're invited, like you can see these people here, I have a tendency to approve them. This one's invited, this one's invited, um, and this one's invited. Actually, all of these are invited. So I tend to in, um, uh, grant them the ability to join. Um, if I look at uh, people that have, um, like when you go through, you'll see that there are specific questions that you need to answer. So make sure you answer those questions correctly and then you'll be invited, uh, actually um, approved to be uh, a member of the group as well. If you don't, then I will decline you. So like I said, just trying to avoid the spammers and those that are looking at trying to um, just spoil this group and make it something that it, uh, I don't know. I just don't want junk in there, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. All right, so back to all of you awesome listeners. Um, we've got a few more here. We've got um, uh, Victor's from Germany. Um, Afra's is tuning in from India. And Abdullah is from Pakistan. So welcome, everybody. Thanks so much for taking the time to join me live today. All right, before we jump into the actual question and answer session, I want to remind everyone that the comments um, that you're posting, hold off on your questions until I give you the green light. I give you the thumbs up and that's when we'll know, you'll know that it's, I'm going to start looking at those comments to answering the questions because I always start with the listener questions who email them in uh, advance. And also um, I wanted to just take a few minutes just to show you guys a few things that are going on in my life. So I don't know if any of you guys have anything like this, but this is my living room and this is the awesome Christmas tree that my wife uh, she put all those lights on painstakingly and then each of the ornaments are all uh, ones that uh, us and our kids put put on and we make it a real tradition. And as we're closing in on Christmas here, December the 25th, um, it's a special, special time for our family. And you can see we've got um, the the um, 
the nativity scene that's up above the fireplace and uh, and the bright star on the top of our Christmas tree. And this is a huge, huge part of our family and uh, what we do in this holiday season. So I want to wish all of you guys the very, very, very merry uh, merriest Christmas out there and uh, and a holiday to all of the rest of you fine folks. So that's what is in the Holthy House right now. And at night when we turn the lights off and the Christmas lights are shining, sometimes we just like to lay underneath the Christmas tree and, and look up at the lights. Even as a 46-year-old old man that I am, I still love to do that. So a special time of year for us. Um, also, it's another really cool opportunity to give back. And so this is actually, um, we are volunteering at the soup kitchen. And uh, this is where the homeless in Lethbridge are able to come and, uh, and have at least one hot meal during the day. And so we volunteer, and this is our church group who volunteered, um, and uh, just to serve them. And so that last station is these yummy um, sugar cookies dipped in chocolate. And so I had the pleasure of handing those out to, uh, to the people who came uh, for that meal. So very, very fun. That was enjoyable. And then the last thing, this is what my, that I do. Here's my little nephew. Um, but this is us, me and my Calgary Flames uh, uh, gear. I've got, actually got my Calgary Flames pajamas on. I was having so much fun um, wearing all my Calgary Flames hockey gear because I can tell you guys, my Flames are doing awesome this year. Super stoked. So this is what we were doing with our family. And uh, we get together and we skated and, and had a good old time. And, and uh, so that is the Holthy clan. All right, guys, thanks for your patience. I will now take some time to jump into uh, the questions that were sent by listeners, and then we'll move forward with all of you who are tuning in uh, via um, the live feed who are going to be posting your questions here in just a little bit. So Maru and those of you, hold off on posting your questions. I'll tell you when the time is, and then I start in the feed at the time in which I say, let's move forward. Okay, all right. So here is the first question. This one's from Aaron. And he says, uh, IRCC asked me to provide a police certificate both for me and my wife. The local, policeman, um, the local policeman officer did forward the certificates to the Canadian Embassy and the immigration officer um, upload. I got an email from him that, um, uh, let's see, I'm just trying to sort this out. I got an email uh, um, from him. So the officer upload the certificate, certificates to my file. I'm looking at my application. I still see replacement needed. Should I be worried? Okay, so I'll tell you right now, Aaron, and I'm just going to jump back and record the start of this. Um, I can tell you, Aaron, that you have an obligation to upload it. It's not the, the officer that does it. They may have um, the information that they provide to you, but it's your obligation to upload your RCMP police clearances and that should be visible in your document checklist, your personal document checklist. And this is something that many people don't realize. When you get a request from the government, sometimes the letter of request will say, upload it through the case-specific inquiry. And then you'll be sitting there and you'll wonder, what the heck is going on? Why is my profile not advancing? Well, always, always go back, go back into your document checklist for your EAPR and see if they have created a separate section for you to upload, in this case, your RCMP police clearances too. And often they do. So if you have that space that's open, Aaron, then you need to make sure that you're actually uploading the police, the RCMP police clearances into those boxes and then resubmitting it. So re, uh, refiling that electronic um, information again. So you can't just upload it and just leave it. You actually have to go forward and continue and resubmit your EAPR to get that information locked in. Okay, so great question, Aaron. Um, so always be aware of that. Always if within the, uh, your MyCIC portal, always remember that even if the government asks you to do something a certain way, sometimes there's glitches in the system and the actual request will remain open in your profile. And if you have a timeline for responding and they've set that timeline in your profile and then you upload it to the case specific inquiry through the government's web form outside of your profile, it's possible that your express entry application could even get returned or refused for not responding in a timely fashion. Um, even though it's no fault of your own because you actually followed the instructions that were given. So always go back, always make sure. And if there's a separate spot open, 
upload that extra document there, okay? So that's just a little tip on how to deal with your um, request for more information from IRCC. All right, great question, Aaron. Thank you very much. Okay, this question is a, um, it's a fairly detailed one. It's from Manish, but we'll see what we can do to answer this one. So he says, and I'll make a note of the start time here. He says, my query is regarding reference letters. My knock is 2282. Do we have to write and mention job duties and responsibilities exactly as it is written in the lead statement or points of the NOC given in the IRCC website? Or we may just write job duties and responsibilities in our own language by taking reference from the lead statement of the NOC and main duties mentioned for NOC or IRCC website. And so that's essentially the, the crux of the question. And he says, okay, let's take an example and let's actually, I'm going to share my screen back with you fine people here and I'm going to go back in and I am going to actually go back to the knock so we can, so I can show you exactly what Manish is talking about here. So the position that he's talking about is 2282. So when we pull this up, you can see that this is user support technicians. Now, the requirements for proving that you have the requirements to, to claim work experience in a particular knock are linked specifically to demonstrating that you are performing all of the activities in this lead statement, as well as a substantial number of these main duties. And so what um, Manish is asking here is when we're producing our reference letter, do we have to copy exactly what we do here? Do we copy these duties exactly into our reference letter? And do we copy this information in the lead statement exactly? Or do we use our own words basically to describe it? And I can tell you guys, hands down, without any reservation whatsoever, never, ever, ever copy these word for word. Do not do it. That is not how um, ex uh, the, my CI, the um, IRCC expects you to do it. In fact, if you do copy it, they'll wonder if you're actually telling the truth or whether you're just making things up. So they will look at it and they'll say, wow, did he actually do everything exactly as it's worded here, even though he's working for a company in India? Well, they're going to doubt. They're going to have concerns whether your actual reference letter is legitimate or honest or whether it's just fake if you're just copying word for word. So obviously, the first starting point for you and for everybody else when they're doing the reference letters is to list the duties that you actually perform. So 100% honesty, okay? And if you have the ability to, um, when you're creating your, your reference letter, you're always gonna follow the pattern that your employer uses within their company. Now, job duties are going to, they're gonna vary, but remember, it's okay if they're not perfectly aligned. You just have to be able to show that you've performed a substantial number of these main duties. And so what is a substantial number? Well, maybe 75%. So when I talk about the essential duties, you'll see here that some say may, may supervise. Well, this here, folks, is not an essential duty. So this is an optional duty. The essential duties are anything that doesn't say may. So if we're looking at duties, then... Um, Manish here has to perform a substantial number of these duties right here. And so when you're doing your reference letter, you want to be able to identify if we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So maybe five, right? Maybe you want to show that you've done at least five of these main duties. Um, obviously, if you can show seven, that's great. But use your own words, you know, make it correspond for sure. They need to match. But 100% honesty. You're not just going to create a reference letter just to try to show that it matches what your requirements are. Okay. So um, there you go, Manish. I hope that answered your question. Okay. Next question is from Rafi. And uh, Rafi says, I hope this email finds you well. I've been following your blog for the last couple of weeks and I have some questions that arise after watching your blog. Okay. So then he goes into detail about first being employed as an engineer, 6221 but he lost his job in December, so it's been a year. Um, he was living in Germany and returned to Bangladesh in August. Since then, he's prepared his IELTS and started a business partnership with his cousin. They have a consultancy firm to help students go abroad. 
In addition to that, he opened a POS in parallel with the consultancy firm. So my question is, how should I prove my income in the POS? This is a point of sale. Basically, we do top up and selling mobile cards in POS. Could you help? Please help me out to prove it. So basically, the question that Rafi has here, and I'm just going to make a note of when this one started as well. This question is all about how to prove self-employed work experience. And I get this probably more than anything else um, when it comes to people asking questions about claiming work experience. So in our completeness check here that the officers follow when they're trying to determine um, that a person has actually completed the work experience that they claim, when it comes to self-employed, this is where you go right here, Rafi. So if the applicant is self-employed, this is what they ask you to provide. So you need to be able to provide, is it an incorporated company? So is there other evidence that you actually own the business? So you need to provide that. Then you need to provide evidence of self-employment income. So do you file taxes? How do you, um, like are there bank statements that you can provide showing the actual income? Do you have um, your annual tax reports or your income statements? or um, your annual returns, anything like that, or all of those things can, can help to show that you're actually being paid, because remember that's a, an essential component. Then documentation from people that actually purchased your services or actually used your services. So do you have an invoice with a payment and then the service or the good that was, that was delivered? That's what you have to show. But remember self-declared main duties are not helpful. So always use an outside third party as much as you can when you're trying to justify this. Now this is obviously just a short little explanation and there's a lot more involved with how to prove self-employed work experience. It's not something that I can canvas completely within this live Q&A, but those are some things to pay attention to and to focus on when you're trying to prove that work experience. Okay, Rafi, thank you. All right, Abdullah. Abdullah asked this question and Abdullah says, Hey there, Mark. It's Abdullah from Lahore, Pakistan. My question is, can I show proof of funds in a recently opened bank account? So I would receive a gift from my father as he is selling his car. Would that be enough for proof of funds? Basically, I'm applying as an accompanying spouse. Me and my wife have recently opened a joint account and my father would be providing us with a gift of 18,000 Canadian. As the account would be less than six months old at the time I apply for my EAPR, how should I show the average balance for the last six months? So what Abdul is referring to here is essentially proof of funds. So if you go back to this page here, and I will pull up the proof of funds section, you'll see here that what the government asks you to provide is an official letter from your financial institution that lists all your current bank and investment accounts, as well as outstanding debts, such as credit cards and loans. So Abdullah, this is the starting point. So the reference letters that you provide from the banks need to be from one or more that list all of your financial situation. That's the starting point. That's what they ask for. Now you'll find people all over the internet that says, no, you don't need to worry about it. You can just provide, excuse me, only what you want them to see. Well, that's not specifically what they're asking for here. So I advise my, my clients to be as comprehensive as they can. Because express entry, as I've said repeatedly, is ruthless. If you are missing something or there's some uncertainty and an officer just doesn't accept your evidence, they're just going to return it. Maybe they're not going to um, you know, refuse the application uh, because of um, some substantive reason, but they can just return it if they feel like it's incomplete. And then you're back at the drawing board. And we've been through this so many times before, folks. But the reality is you may have received an ITA with 440 CRS points. Well, if your application gets returned, the consequences are, are just disastrous. You may go back into the pool. You may be one year older. So you now may have 435 points. So do not take any chances. Don't take any shortcuts. Okay. So what does the letter need to look like? It says that it must include your name and the contact information for the bank, for the financial institution, as well as the address, telephone number, email address for the bank. Then it must list, and this is the letter, the account numbers, the date each account was opened, and the current balance of each account, okay? But then here's the thing that Abdullah was actually focused on. 
the average balance for the past six months? Well, obviously, if it's a newly opened account, then the question I have for you is, do you not have a, pr a prior account? Do you not have another bank account that you can use? That's the account that I would want to have the funds deposited into. And some people may say, well, then the average balance is going to show really low. Well, technically speaking, it's not the average balance of your, the money that you have in your account over that past six months that has to meet the minimum income level, the proof of funds. It's exactly how much money you have in the bank at the time you file your electronic application for permanent residence and the time in which you complete your landing. And so this here is to help an officer to know whether or not that money is actually yours or whether it's just a loan from someone that you have to pay back. If it's a loan, folks, then you can't use it. It has to be your money. So obviously, Abdullah is going to get a gift deed from his father that is going to clearly state that the money is being freely given as a result of love and affection to help Abdullah and his family immigrate to Canada. But it isn't necessarily a deal breaker if that money isn't in the account for six months before applying. But there is no, no reason that the funds can't be deposited into a previous bank account. And then you just explain in the letter of explanation that the funds are gifted. Whether they're in your current account that you use for living, that has your income that may not be substantial, but it shows the income coming in and the expenses going out. When you compare that to a brand new account, an officer is going to have just the same question. Where did the money come from? So ultimately, you can decide what you want to do. But if you are getting a large sum of money from a family member like this, such as your father, um, I actually advise my clients to have it deposited into their real account and then explain. We got it as a gift from my father. I've attached a gift deed and it is for it is an irrevocable gift that is entirely for my purposes. And it's not alone. And that's what I would do. All right. Great question, Abdullah. Thank you for asking that, my friend. All right. Now I'm going to jump back here. And this question is from Raj. And uh, we'll get the start time here. Raj says, I'm from India. I already have gotten my ITA. Congratulations, Raj. That's awesome. Um, and I'm working on submitting the documents. I've got two questions. Okay. I'm actually going to have a consult with Raj to address question number two because it's a lot more involved than we can answer here. And if you have questions that are also super complicated and are specifically for, um, you know, that just a unique circumstance in your life, they wouldn't be appropriate to have here. This is all based on general information that benefits all of the, you know, over 100,000 members of our group that watch these videos and those on YouTube. So understand that this, um, that the questions need to be of general in nature. If they're not and you have something specific, then by all means, schedule a consult with me. And you can, as you can see from all the reviews left on my um, Canadian Immigration Institute Facebook page, on the Stringham, Google reviews, everything, the 30 minutes will be well worth your time and we can address almost everything that a person brings at me. Aside from reviewing your whole application, I can't do that in 30 minutes. And that's something else I'm going to talk about at the end of the video. A special, special offer that I'm making to people. Okay, seems like I always have these special offers, but you guys make it so easy for me to do that. I just love doing these things. Okay, so here's the question. It's regarding my communication of address. So I was living in my own house when I got my police clearance last month. We are doing some renovation work and I have moved out to a known person's flat for uh, a rent for a couple of months. Um, should I update the address in my EE profile now? Should I get a police clearance again? Okay, so the question one about updating your profile. You already have an ITA. So when you're filing your EAPR in your personal history, you're, there's, you're going to have an explanation of what you're doing, but there's also an address history that you have to disclose in your contact information. And that address, you're 100% going to indicate that you're now living in a different home. And so for that period, you are going to list exactly where you were living. And it's usually down to the very day. So you don't want to um, say that you were still in that house if you're actually living somewhere else, because that just wouldn't be true. So ultimately, when it comes to police clearances, that's a little bit of a different story. Some countries, it doesn't matter. It's not based on where you live, your police clearance. So for example, if you were to obtain a clearance certificate here in, um, in Canada, it doesn't matter whether you live in, um, in 
Nova Scotia, Halifax, Nova Scotia, or Vancouver, BC. The RCMP covers the whole country. And many countries in the world, it's, it doesn't matter. But if you come from a country where address and your, your police clearance is based on your address and the search is all based at a local level on your address, then it's never going to hurt for you to get another one for that time period in which you moved and lived in a different residence. If it makes a substantial change to your police clearance report. Okay, so uh, if you've if you've moved and your country is such that you need to have um, a police clearance based on your actual address, then there's your answer. If not, then you don't need to worry about it. All right. Great question. And Raj, I look forward to our consultation to talk about your other much more complicated issue. Great question. Okay, last question. And we're doing pretty good because we're about at the 30 minute mark, which means all of you faithful people that are watching live you are going to get your questions answered. So, but not yet. I'll do one more here. Okay. So this one here, this question is from Sruthi. And Sruthi says, Hi, I'm Sruthi from India. I'm having some confusion with work experience. I worked seven months in one company and 2.5 years in another company. My total work experience is exactly three years, but I have a doubt whether the seven month experience, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> experience will be calculated. I got an information that less than one year experience is not taken. I'm not sure to what extent it is true. If it is not valid, then I will lose points because the total is less than three years. Please advise me on this. Okay, so what Sruthi is talking about here is the requirements for claiming work experience. And I'm going to go in and I'm going to share my screen again. And those of you faithful people who are watching are going to get the benefit from a pretty amazing little explanation here. So it all comes down to the Federal Skilled Worker Program eligibility. And this is where many, many people are confused. So if you're outside of Canada, this is where you're going you're gonna to apply. It's going to be first you have to meet the minimum um, eligibility requirements for this Federal Skilled Worker Program and for express entry. And this is where it is, okay? So when I go down here, how the program works, talks about the selection factors, blah, blah, blah. Ultimately, in order to meet the first threshold, you have to have at least one year of skilled work experience and um, there's a language requirement, but ultimately it comes down to this selection factor right here. 67 points out of 100 point grid is the threshold. Now remember, this is not express entry. This is before express entry. And because it works in the background, many people don't even realize it's there. Um, but you still have to meet these requirements. Now, in your case, Ruthie, I'm almost positive that you, you don't have any issues with meeting this. But I want to show people, just for the purposes of this, when you're claiming work experience points, you need to, you can see here, you get nine points for one year, two to three years is 11 points. So the difference between you, Sruthi, would be getting either 11 points if they accepted, well, really, it would be 11 points. Because whether you had two or three years, it's the same. In order to get points under this, the selection criteria for work experience, right here, all of the work experience that you have or that you've completed must be in the same national occupational classification code. Okay? And so it gives you explanation here. It has to be at least 30 hours per week or an equal amount in part time, basically 15 hours over a 24 month period. At, and, and in a skill type 0A or B. And the key here, guys, is that it has to be all in the same knock. So if we go back here and we keep scrolling down, actually, I'm going to go back one more time here to get back to the, um, the, the entry level. One more here. Yeah, there we go. So once you're here, you'll see that for claiming points under the Federal Skilled Worker Program, the eligibility assessment, you can only claim points in one knock and the work must be continuous. But once you meet this minimum threshold and you qualify and you, you, you're able to get um, all of this and you can see here at least one year continuous work, after you meet that threshold, then it shifts to the Federal Skilled Worker Program. Oh, sorry, then it shifts, sorry, to the Comprehensive Ranking System Assessment. And when, it, when you start to go through the Comprehensive Ranking System Assessment, that's where, if we pull up here, we'll, we'll do CRS criteria. Let's see if we can find it. You'll see here, this is where the points are awarded. And ultimately, the only time 
foreign work experience means anything is in the skill transferability factors right here. Let's close that out of the way. So when you're looking at foreign work experience, you can get an extra 50 points if you have um, good language proficiency and foreign work experience. And what does that mean? Well, let's jump all the way down here quick and I'll show you what I mean by that. So once we break it down to, to the foreign work experience right here, <clears throat> it all comes down to having at least three years or more of foreign work experience. So if you have your CLB9 and three or more years of foreign work experience, you're going to get 50 points. So then it comes down to the question, well, how do they calculate this? Well, for the purposes of the comprehensive ranking system, um, Sruthi, you do not have to have continuous work experience, nor does it have to be in the same knock. You can take bits and pieces of work experience and bundle it together to form the maximum of three years of foreign work experience that you need. But remember, your primary knock that you use has to be at least one year. And it looks to me like you have it already because you said you worked for two and a half years in, in one company. So the break isn't critical, but you do need to make sure that the full time that you have, 2.5 years plus the seven, that's cutting it really close. And remember, you have to work for the full year. So you can't accumulate the 1,560 hours in less than a year um, and then say that that's, you know, that meets the minimum requirements to claim that year of work experience under the comprehensive ranking system. It still has to be full time, 30 hours a week for a minimum of 1,560 hours and over that full, you know, in this case, 36 month period. All right. So hopefully that answered the question. It was a little bit more in depth, but hey, I want to reward people who take the time to connect to be a part of this. Okay, guys, it is now time. So now starting this moment, you can start posting your questions in the comment. And we, the last comment I see here is Faraj. And, um, and uh, so right, I'll start with Faraj's comment and then we'll move on from here. So Faraj says, uh, hi Mark, I'm from Libya, I live in the US. You mentioned before that when you accidentally upload a black and white police certificate, it caused a problem. The US police certificate I received is a black and white one. Do you think this will be fine? Ultimately, it just has to be a copy of the original certificate. So if the original is in black and white, then, then that's all you can submit. But remember, there's a difference between black and white and dark blue in some cases. So you have to make sure that what you've uploaded is the actual color copy of what you received. And I would go so far as to, in the letter of explanation, explain that this is what it looks like. This is what my copy looks like when I request it. It comes in black and white. And I can tell you that, you know, that, like I said, IRCC, it's stupid that they refused the application, that they kicked it back. It's absolutely ridiculous. And I'm, I'm really still upset about it. But the reality is you can't take any chances. So in your situation, Faraj, I would, I would include in a letter of explanation at the front of your police clearance section, your police certificate section, indicating that this is the original. Please note it looks black and white, but that's exactly how I received it. Okay? Just abundance of caution. Because yes, did I get bit because of it? Yes. Is it a stupid, ridiculous rule? Yes, it is. But this is the world we're living in. Express entry is volatile. It's painful. And for those who make mistakes, it can mean the difference in you getting immigration in Canada and not. Okay. Next question is Visha. And she says, hi, Mark. Can photos converted to PDF be used instead of a scan of the document? I cannot get a scan of the document and it, as it was already surrendered. So I don't have the physical document, but I have a digital photo of it. Visha, that's something that I can't answer. Um, if, as long as the copy that you have is clear and legible, then how you obtain that, whether it's a photo or an actual scan or converted PDF, um, that's not relevant. It's just a matter of making sure that it is legible and that the government officers can can read it and understand exactly what it is and see that it is legitimate. All right, Faraj says, thank you so much. You're welcome, Faraj. Okay, next question is Sahil and he says, hi Mark, kindly tell me, is it possible that funds are in a secondary applicant and make a bank statement? Is it fine? Kindly tell me about it. Sahil, I think what you're asking is if the funds can be in the bank account of the accompanying spouse and the answer is yes, they can. 
So you just need to make sure. And sometimes I'll include a little letter from the spouse saying, you know, the, the accompanying spouse, remember, that yes, these funds are available for our family support and settlement in Canada. All right. Okay. Let's see. We're cruising along here, covering some good ground. Next question is Amir. I must have job offer or if I find my knock, it's enough to make interest to Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan has the occupations in demand list. And so this is one of the, the main programs. And actually, Amir, I'll post, I'll go here just so that everybody can see. So I'm going to pull it up and then I'm going to shift my screen so everybody can see. And it's the Saskatchewan occupations in demand category. And so you'll see here that the Saskatchewan in demand occupations list, the first hurdle that you have to overcome is that you're not, your work experience is on the list. This list changes all the time, guys. And so whenever they have a new round of invitations, they will, um, they will update this list. And as long as your occupation is on this list, you've met step one. Then once you've gone through that process and have actually your, your, your position is on the list, then there's an actual assessment where you express an interest and then they assess you based on points that are allocated similar to express entry, but not exactly the same. So there's points, extra points awarded for people that have up to 10 years of skilled work experience that they can prove. And the pass mark changes as well. Um, there's bonus points given for people who have a connection with Saskatchewan, whether you've worked there or have otherwise, you know, family or things like that. So in your situation, um, if, we, if we just jump back here and go back to the question that was asked, um, um, a job offer is absolutely a, a huge bonus plus, but Saskatchewan, the expression of interest process for occupations in demand is one of the last few programs where technically you could immigrate to Saskatchewan even though you don't have a direct link with the province. Okay, good. Abdi says, hi, Mark. Abdi, good to see you, my friend. <clears throat> and Abdi is probably wondering, Mark, can you give me an update on my work permit and my, <laughs> and my permanent residence? My friend, yes, no word yet, but we're watching it like a hawk. And the moment I hear anything, I will notify you. Thanks for your patience. Okay, Pascal says, can we mention the same address to reside in Canada for me and my sister if we are pre presenting EE profile each one on the side? Well, of course you can live with your family member. That's not an issue. I don't see any issues with that at all. Okay. Afraz says, do we have to mention travel dates after our acknowledgement of receipt? If there is a short vacation trip abroad after submitting the application? The answer is no. Once you've submitted your application, it locks in. Now an officer can always go back and ask questions or ask you to provide further information. That's within their ability. But understand when it comes to all the information that you put into your EAPR, the only thing that I would really focus on updating if it changed is your address and your contact information. That's what's important to update. Okay. Okay. All right. Visha says, thanks. You're the best. You're welcome, Visha. Okay. Jamesh says, I have questions regarding GCMS notes. Uh, okay. This is my pet peeve, guys. GCMS notes. All right. Ironically, I was, I was on the panel, um, the moderator for essentially the GCMS notes, uh, section of our last Canadian um, Bar Association National Immigration section that we had earlier this year. I was on the panel with the officers who oversaw GCMS and all of the internal electronic systems and the access to information folks. And so very familiar with it. So I think I'm pretty well positioned to answer this question, Jamesh. He says, does it annoy an officer if you apply for the notes more than once? How accurate is the due date mentioned in the notes and does review mean verification or just decision making? Okay, Jamesh, um, I think it irritates the people that are having to actually produce that and print it off. But if there's uncertainty and you want to know where your application's at, there's no harm in doing it. Now, with that being said, I personally, if a client has an application that is under six months, I will never file a request for them. It serves no purpose because ultimately the application is going to be processed as it is. And my clients, I know whether there's going to be an issue or not. And so I don't need to look and wonder what an officer is doing at, at what stage they're at. It's a complete waste of time for everyone. And how accurate are these? Well, half the time, by the time you get them, there could be four or five steps that have already occurred. And so 
to advance your situation. And so the, your file could, the notes that are there could be stale dated. It could be well beyond it. So that's a reality. So does review mean verification or just decision making? Well, I can't answer that question without looking at your actual GCMS notes. But, um, you know, just intuitively review means they're in the process of, of, of verifying. All right. Um, okay. Moving on, Hassan. He says, for the refresher about to apply for Canadian Express Entry, which one is advisory to go for if you are above 40 years of age? Express Entry or Provincial Nominee Program? Hassan, if you're above 40, it's unlikely you're going to qualify directly to Express Entry without a job offer. And when it comes to the various PNP programs, they're often heavily, heavily weighted to people who are already working in those provinces. Like I said, the Saskatchewan Immigrant Nominee Program is one. Sometimes uh, the Nova Scotia program will open up with an occupation and demand list. But generally speaking, it's going to be hard for you unless you have really high education um, and your language scores are off the charts. And even maybe you have a connection. So for you, Hassan, I would probably be looking at seeing if you can find a job offer, which trust me, I know is not easy. But with that being said, employers are always looking for good people. And even myself now, I'm hiring for an immigration paralegal to come work with me in my office in Lethbridge. And it has not been easy to find someone who has any experience. So I'm having to cast my net very broad all across Canada to try to find a permanent resident or citizen who's able to take that job um, because uh, I can't employ a foreign national um, within this type of position. Okay, uh, next question. Um, uh, oh, Amir says, thanks so much, Mark, and Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you, Amir. Okay, uh, Sahil says, thanks, Mark. You solved it, actually. One thing more, I have worked in 2014 for one year, but my reference letter is not explained same as in CIC required. So in this case, can I make a new one and issue date to 2018? Of course, 100%. And what Sahil is asking here is what if the old reference letter I got when I left the company that I worked for, what if it doesn't meet the minimum requirements of express entry? Well, absolutely go back and get a new one that does contain the information that express entry is looking for. And some of you are saying, well, what is that information? Well, if I jump back here and share my screen again, I'll just pull it up here. This is special for Sahil. And actually, I'll pull in this one here and I'll go back to work experience. Uh, oh, I'm on the wrong page. That's why I'm not pulling it up. Let's find it right here. There it is. Okay. So when I'm here, <clears throat> you'll see the letter actually has to contain all positions held while employed at the company and must include the following details. And this is what your letter has to include. Job title, duties and responsibilities, job status, if it's your current job, dates worked for the company, and some of the ones that are often missing, number of hours per week and annual salary plus benefits. So those are the specific things that you need to include in your letter. And so when I'm thinking here about the, the question that was just asked, I'm just going to pull this up here. Um, um, you're absolutely going to go back and make sure, Sahil, that that uh, reference letter that you're seeking contains that information. If not, you could get your application refused. Okay, um, so Fian says, Hi Mark, I have three years and a half with the company A and one year with company B, that based in Canada with a consultancy contract. Can I just apply with company A to avoid any confusion? Absolutely. Um, so Fian, the key is showing three years of maximum of foreign work experience. Once you have more than three years, you're not getting any more comprehensive ranking system points. But make sure that not including that other one year with the company in Canada, that somehow that doesn't um, uh, mean that you're going to fall below the selection criteria for the Federal Skilled Worker Program. And that's what we're talking about right here. I'll shift my screen back. That's what we're talking about right here. So in order to qualify for eligibility through the Federal Skilled Worker Program, and maybe, well, I don't know where your work experience is. I'm assuming that the, the other years were outside of Canada. But for, for this process, you have to meet the selection factors and work experiences on that list. All right. Okay. Great question. Okay. We'll jump back here. Just a couple more and then we'll wrap up. Okay. So um, Jamesh says, thank you so much, Mark. You're the star. Thank you. Sahil says, great work, Mark. God bless you. Thank you, Sahil. Okay. We'll end off with uh, Shafin here. 
Hi, Mark. Please let me know whether a marketing executive for a resort qualifies for the NOC 1123. Professional occupations and advertising. This is the closest NOC I could find for the job duties and the title marketing executive. So this is an exact um, reason why I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna share my screen with you guys here quick one more time and I'm gonna take you to here the secret to finding your correct knock on my Canadian immigration podcast website right here I'm gonna copy this link I'm gonna go back to Shafin and I'm gonna reply directly to him and I'm gonna paste this comment this here is not something that I actually can answer in our um, in a live Q&A like this. And the reason for that, Shafin, is because I need to see your actual duties in order to confirm that NOC 1123 actually works for you. So that's something that I can't do through this. And, and in fact, most of, the, um, most of the paid consultations that I do all hover around that specific issue. Um, at least it forms a part of the consultations, all right? All right, guys, I want to express sincere appreciation to everybody that participated in my eLive Q&A today. Your questions are what makes this worthwhile. Um, I had, I, you know, I'll often have questions that are asked over and over again um, that relate to the same types of topics. And really, once you reach a certain stage, um, it, you know, there's only so many things that I can answer. Uh, so those of you who come on and you ask the questions and you get your questions answered, you're the ones who make this express entry live Q&A totally worth it. I want to also point out once again a couple other things that are available for you guys as resources. So this one here, I'm just going to go back here again, Canadian Immigration Podcast. This is something that's available and um, every couple weeks or so, the last one I released was on December the 10th. I've got another one that I'm going to release, uh, but this was what's new with, uh, with Quebec Immigration. And I, uh, lawyer Jenna Evelyn joined me on that one. And I've got a whole host of other, other topics um, and on a number of different Canadian immigration issues. And so uh, that's a resource that's available for you guys. And then um, obviously here, the Canadian Immigration Institute, which you can find on YouTube. And I've talked at length about all the videos over the past number of, you know, I guess, how long has this site been active? I can't even remember. It's, uh, well, at least over a year for sure that I've started posting anything of any substance. And so you can find all kinds of information on here, as well as a whole bunch of testimonials, video testimonials from members just like you who have subscribed to my Express Entry Complete Step-by-Step -step Guide to Doing It Yourself. And these were all, um, these were not scripted. These fine people just volunteered to give me these, and I really, really appreciated it. Um, but they are all talking about this right here, my Canadian Immigration Institute. And you can access this. And like I said, I am going to be having a special offer that I'm going to be launching here in just a little bit. But you can enroll in the course and um, you can get a one-time uh, lifetime access or you can break it down into monthly payments or you can even subscribe for a monthly subscription. And when you look at it, and I, I'm just going to scroll back here to the top, the course itself is chock full of everything that you need to do it yourself. And it's a video tutorial. I literally walk you through each step. So you can see it starts with learning the basics, module one. It goes through preparing to submit. So this is stuff even before you go f forward and submit because there may be reasons for you not to do it right away. You may want to hold off. And then completing your profile is module three. And it covers every section, principal applicant, you can see personal details section, contact, study and languages. And then uh, even goes down to how to update your profile after it's been submitted and what it looks like when you receive your ITA. But that's not it. That's just the very, very cusp of what's in here. Then we get into the meat and potatoes, which we call here in Canada. That's the substance. EAPR forms. This is how you answer after you get your ITA. Some of this will have similar information in it, but there are insights on everything from the principal applicant, spouse, dependent children, and then module five is all about your documents. So we go into depth about the document checklist, what everything is being asked, um, you know, some of the common pitfalls, well, really a lot of the common pitfalls, and then how to submit it, and then uploading documents after 
your EP, EAPR has been submitted. Lesson 43 is an interesting one because this is exactly the first question that I started with in this whole video today. The question about what do I do if I get a request from IRCC? Well, this specifically shows you how to deal with that so that you don't miss something. And then, of course, the awesome passport request and receiving your confirmation of permanent residence. And so even that alone would be pretty rock and awesome, showing you how to do everything at a fraction of what you you typically charge a representative. Well, the reality is there's a whole member resource section that has that's chock full of information that's only available for subscribers to this group or people that have booked consultations with me. So everything from you know the basics of how it works, what CRS is, you know the top five things to do before you even think about submitting your profile, top reasons you're deemed ineligible by Express Entry, um, essential documents that you need to submit your Express Entry profile, um, top five reasons that your application can even get refused. And so these are inf these are, these ones are are specifically addressed to the more general aspects of Express Entry. But then I dive in in specific detail on how to claim work experience for Express Entry. And in fact, I actually address the whole area of self-employed work experience extensively in here. Then I've got one on how to increase your language score. Wow, if we go to our Express Entry Law Private Facebook group, I can tell you that probably a third of the questions are about people talking about how to increase their language scores. And then the eligibility. How do I know if I qualify? and then how to increase my chance of getting an ITA. This one is probably one of the most valuable of all of the, the videos that I do, because some of you may not be reaching high enough to get an ITA. Well, this one is dedicated specifically to all of my best tips and strategies on trying to increase your chances of getting uh, that lovely, magical ITA. And then job offers, job offers, what is it? And why are they so hard to get? Um, what if I don't have proof of funds? And this is where, what do I do if I need to get that proof of funds from my dad, which was also another question that was just answered today. Well, this goes into tremendous detail. Um, police clearances, how to ensure yours are correct. Oh yeah, I learned the hard way with this one. And then dependent family members. Sometimes your dependent family members can mess up your express entry application. I cover all of the ins and outs of that and how to deal with tricky and difficult situations. And then this is a bonus feature how non-accompanying spouse, how to complete the EAPR forms. And I'll show you guys, I'm trying to think if I still have it visible. I did actually share this with everybody at one point in time as a bonus feature. But non-accompanying spouse, how to complete the forms, and it's a complete walkthrough. And then, you know what, I'm gonna stop there because it just goes and goes and goes and goes and goes, and these are, and it's still going. These are all, all for you guys. And um, like I said, this is all housed right here in the Express Entry Complete Step-by-Step -step Guide to Doing It Yourself. All you have to do is type in CanadianImmigrationInstitute.com and that will take you exactly where you need to go. And so if I type this in here, all you have to do is type in Let's see how this looks here right there it's a little bit a little bit light all right I'm just gonna adjust this right at the very end of our day here because the Sun is starting to shine a little bit more out there turn that down a bit there we go that's a little bit better so right here where is it easy to see probably right there Canadian immigration Institute.com that's where you can access it and then the last thing that I want to show you as I wrap up today is that many of you right now have um, ITAs that you've received and you're just trying to get the information you need to, to deal with some issue that isn't clear and you don't want to take a chance of, of making a mistake. Well, right here on my firm website, if you just go to the stringham.ca website and I'll actually, for those of you who are uh, watching this on our Express Entry Law Private Facebook group, I'm just going to put into the comments section the link for you to book a paid consultation with me. And um, one of the things when it comes to scheduling a consult right now, if you go back to our group and you look at the announcements, one of the offers that I have right now, which is probably my best value offer out of all of the services that I grant, I've got a consult, obviously, that you guys can book with me. 
and it's for 30 minutes. It's 100 if you're working with Billy or 200 if you want to hire me um, for that consult. Um, when you book a consult, you get the guide at 50% off. And then I have three different levels of service because people sometimes don't need as much help. Other times they, they just want complete peace of mind. So I've created options for you. The bronze plan is where I will do a complete review of just your documents. Then if we shift over to the silver plan, which is really the best value plan for $2,500 Canadian, remember that's not American, Canadian, plus our sales tax, I will actually go in and review your full application with you before you click submit. And of all of the services that I offer, that is the one that more of my clients are booking than any other now. And rather than paying me to have you fill out one of my firm questionnaires and then send it to my assistant, who then uploads all the information into my representative portal, you can save $2,500 without me having to pay my staff to do it, by doing it yourself through your own MyCIC account. And then what I do is I go in and I do a screen share with you and we look at everything. We share your documents via Dropbox so that you're able to upload exactly what will be uploaded into your EAPR. And I go through, check those in advance, make sure everything is correct. And then we go through together, you and I, question by question, all the way through until We've completed everything, all of the sections in your EAPR, and you have complete comfort and confidence to click submit. And so that service that I offer for my clients is probably the most popular right now. But some of you out there are like, I am so busy. I don't have time to do anything. Look, Mark, I just want you to handle everything. Give me the peace of mind in knowing that it's in your hands. And that's where the gold plan is. And that full peace of mind concierge level service is $5,000 Canadian. And guys, I can tell you that this truly is concierge. So you can see the breakdown is all here. And if you're wondering where this is, all you have to do is go to our Express Entry Law private Facebook group and then make sure that you click on announcements right here. And right at the top, the first post that you should be able to see. And if you can't, you can always go back and you can, you can select... Um, you can have it open up to show other uh, announcements if you, um, if you don't see it. And then that full list of announcements will be posted. So this is it right here, my full fee structure and levels so everybody knows what my charges are and I'm happy to work with you. So guys, thanks so much for sticking with me, especially you guys that have hung on here all the way to the end. It really means a lot. It's been another great express entry, um, complete, um, uh, actually, I've got this here. I got to clear out some of the stuff here. I got floating around my screen. It's been another awesome EE Live Q&A. Thanks so much for tuning in. This is Canadian immigration lawyer Mark Holthy, ex-immigration officer and former high school teacher, signing off as always, wishing you guys all the best as you navigate this crazy world that we call Express Entry. All right. See you later.